According to reports, we're facing the bee apocalypse. Pollinators are dying out, the results will be much of our food will disappear. If true, it's seriously worrying. But is it true? Well, let's have a look. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. In one of my Friday Roundup videos recently, I covered the Extinction Rebellion campaigners dressing up as bees to glue themselves to buses. I made a passing comment about how bees are not endangered and got some immediate kickback from one or two campaigners. Well, it's an important area. There are some real consequences after all. So I thought I'd take some time to look more deeply into the question and see if we can come up with the definitive concrete answers. As always, references to the peer-reviewed papers that support what I present here are given in the video description. 90% of the world's plant species are pollinated by animals of one sort or another, and that includes the plant species that we eat. 75% of agricultural crops rely on pollination, and if we look at the main pollinators for those crops, we're mostly talking about bees. There are something like 20,000 species of bees worldwide, and there's no doubt that some of those species have declined significantly. And over recent years, we've heard a number of stories that have provoked alarm with a possible wider decline with catastrophic consequences. One story has been about colony collapse disorder, where hives simply die off, and there have been various theories floated as to why. One story has been about the impact of certain pesticides, specifically neonicotinoids, which campaigners think are particularly harmful. And another story has been about parasite mites, the Varroa destructor, for clues in the name. And of course you understand the fear. Some forces unseen that we've provoked into action, but we little understand, lead to a sudden and inexplicable extinction of a whole type of insect and our crops go unpollinated. When evaluating the likelihood of that happening, the first thing you have to realise is that we're talking about two very different things here. One is managed hives of honeybees, the pollinating services of which are available for hire to the farmers with the appropriate crops, and the other is wild bees. Campaigners have focused on both at different points, so let's quickly cover both, starting with the managed hives. In the US in the last couple of years, the news has been apparently grim. According to ABC News, amongst others, there was a 40% decline in bee population last winter, which is obviously unsustainable. It said this, over the past 15 years, bee colonies have been disappearing in what is known as the colony collapse disorder, according to National Geographic. Some regions have seen losses of up to 90%, the publication reported. Well, I checked the link for National Geographic that was provided, and it came from a section for kids, and it wasn't referenced. But the rest of the article referenced a survey carried out by the Bee Informed Partnership, a non-profit associated with the University of Maryland. Between October 1st, 2018 and April 1st, 2019, 37.7% of the managed honeybee population, colonies kept by commercial beekeepers, declined, which is 7 percentage points more than the same time frame during the 2017-2018 winter. For the entire year, April 1st, 2018 to April 1st, 2019, the managed bee population decreased by 40.7% according to the report. The overall loss rate is around the average of what researchers and beekeepers have seen since 2006. Now you might be thinking, my God, if 40% bees died off in one year, then just a couple more years, the whole lot will be gone. And if you review the Bee Informed Partnership report, you might well think that, because all it talks about is the percentage of losses. But of course that isn't the case. What they don't mention is that new hives are also added, and some are regenerated. In recent years, the number of commercial hives in the USA has been broadly static after a significant decline decades ago. Professional beekeepers are, well, professional. They manage their hives well. And the varroa mites and the colony collapse problems, which are definitely problems, and have raised the winter loss rates from hives that used to be standard at 15%, those losses have been offset by producing new hives. How do they add new hives? Generally by splitting their colonies in the spring. They can divide a parent colony into two or three new colonies and can purchase fertilised queens to take those colonies on. And while numbers have been broadly static in the US, they've actually been rising worldwide. This doesn't make everything pain-free and healthy, as some people would suggest. No, 
we're in no apparent danger of losing the services of managed beehives anytime soon, but the percentage of winter losses created financial pain for beekeepers. Beekeepers said that they felt a 22% winter loss rate for hives was an acceptable rate for their business, but 62% of them reported they had lost more colonies than that rate. So let's be clear, there are problems with managed beehives. The number one reported stress factor is the Varroa mite. Although colony collapse disorder is a thing, it declined in 2019 against the 2018 level. The honeybee colony numbers are stable, but we should be respectful of the fact that it is a system apparently under some stress. It would be good if those winter loss percentages would go down. There have been some increases in the fees charged by pollinators in the US, which might make some think there must be shortages because the prices are going up. In fact, it's been caused by an increase in demand for hives from the producers of almonds, a crop which has seen high acreage growth to the extent that it now accounts for 82% of paid pollination services. And it can be hard to track that growth of demand in the short term, as almonds bloom before the point in the season where beekeepers can split their hives. Anyway, so that's for managed bees. No danger of extinction on the horizon there. But what about wild bees? Because after all, the agricultural land that needs the services of wild pollinators is significantly larger than the lands that use the services of managed hives. And we've seen declines in many insect populations, particularly caused by vanishing habitats. It's not easy to answer the question of whether there's a global pollinator decline because of a lack of pollinator monitoring programs and long-term data worldwide. The best data comes from the EU and they show strong evidence of declines. However, there's a key question, which is whether the species of wild bees that are most involved with pollinating crops are under threat. A study has shown that the most threatened species of bees are rarely observed on crops. But actually, it's a very small subset of common species that are involved. And not only that, but where such species may have a problem, simple conservation measures seem to be highly effective at restoring them. I quote, Dominant crop pollinators persist under agricultural expansion and many are easily enhanced by simple conservation measures, suggesting that cost-effective management strategies to promote crop pollination should target a different set of species than management strategies to promote threatened bees. Conserving the biological diversity of bees therefore requires more than just ecosystem service-based arguments. This observation came from a paper that was pointing out that there are benefits to widespread conservation efforts and that using the economic arguments from pollination services to justify the conservation of bees creates an unintended effect because conserving pollinating bees can actually be augmented very easily in ways that have no knock-on benefit to actual threatened species. To come to that conclusion, it used data from 90 studies and 1,394 crop fields. They found that 2% of the species in the regional species pool accounted for almost 80% of the crop visits by pollinators. Species under threat constituted negligible numbers of those visits by pollinators. Biodiversity management practices, including planting wildflowers and establishing grass margins, substantially enhanced the number of crop visits by bees. The study made this conclusion. Our findings present a novel and more nuanced interpretation. While most bee species decline in abundance with expansion of agriculture, the species currently providing most of the pollination services to crops persist. There was a study of wild bees undertaken in the US in 2013. Of 187 native species analysed, only three had declined steeply, all of which were species of bumblebees. Eight species of US bees have been placed on the endangered list, species of Hawaiian yellow-faced bees in 2016, and more recently the rusty-patched bumblebee. The factors driving these declines are thought to be mostly associated with habitat loss, natural disasters and invasive species. However, there were large shifts in the makeup of the bee communities. 56% of species show changes in abundance and there are other signs of stress that might be associated with climate change. Interestingly, what doesn't emerge much from these papers at all is anything that matches the apparent top priority of many of the campaigners, which is the use of agricultural pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids. If you look at what groups like Greenpeace are saying about bees, you get a very specific take. For instance, 
Scientists know that bees are dying from a variety of factors. Pesticides, drought, habitat destruction, nutrition deficit, air pollution, global warming and more. Many of these causes are interrelated. The bottom line is that we know humans are largely responsible for the two most prominent causes, pesticides and habitat loss. It goes on to imply that neonicotinoid pesticides are probably a big part of the reason why colony collapse disorder happens. Greenpeace, along with a number of others, have been campaigning for a ban on such pesticides, a campaign which has been largely successful within Europe. But there seems to be a problem with this take. Australia sees the use of neonicotinoid pesticides, but it does not have incidences of colony collapse disorder. If such collapses were caused by pesticides, you'd expect to see them wherever those pesticides are used. The other thing they don't have in Australia might be more to the point. They don't have the Varroa mite that has been infecting colonies in other parts of the world with a number of diseases. So while you shouldn't take correlation to be causation without some careful additional analysis, it's hard to maintain a cause and effect argument for neonicotinoids and colony collapse. Doesn't mean, of course, that neonicotinoids cause no harm to bees. They're pesticides. Killing stuff is kind of a point of them. But used properly, the evidence is not solid that they're having the major effect that the campaigners claim for them. Certainly some studies have shown that neonicotinoids cause harm to bees, although some of those studies have been criticised for overdosing and not being as reliable as more costly and time-consuming in-field trials. In 2017, the EPA in the state said that its assessments for free neonicotinoids showed that most approved uses do not pose significant risk to bee colonies, but spray applications to a few crops, such as cucumbers, berries and cotton, may pose risks to bees that come in direct contact with residue. Well, that's not quite the stuff of the bee apocalypse, And banning those chemicals does have real consequences. In the face of the EU ban... European farmers have seen a number of problems with crops blighted by pests and they've compensated by increasing the use of other insecticides such as synthetic pyrethroids. Within 10 months of the ban on neonicotinoid pesticides justified by the way by the precautionary principle which I've discussed here before, farmers in the UK reported significant crop losses for canola due to an infestation of cabbage stem flea beetles. The pyrethroids used instead are much less effective on the pests, while still not being great for the bees either. It's not a huge surprise that some of the Brexit campaigners have held up freedom from EU regulations to be something that might benefit farmers by not needing to follow such restrictions. There's no doubt that the campaigners have been inconsistent when it comes to the story they tell about what is or isn't happening with bees. For instance, in 2016, the Sierra Club focused the attention on managed honeybee hives. Bees had a devastating year. 44% of colonies killed and Bayer and Syngenta are still flooding your land with bee-killing toxic neonic pesticides, now among the most widely used crop sprays in the country. But by 2018, they changed their tune to focus on wild bees instead. Honeybees are at no risk of dying off. While diseases, parasites and other threats are certainly real problems for beekeepers, the total number of managed honeybees worldwide has risen 45% over the last half century. It means you have to look at all these statements really carefully. For instance, at the start of this video, I quoted the standard message that's repeated in all sorts of places, not least by the recent IPBES report on species, which I covered in a previous video which is that 75% of crops rely on pollination. But that statistic isn't quite what it seems. It means 75% of crop varieties, not 75% of all production. In reality, 60% of agricultural production comes from crops that don't rely on pollination. According to the Genetic Literacy Project, only about 7% of crop output is actually in the frame for pollinator declines. Don't let the low percentage fool you, that's a significant amount of food, not to be dismissed as unimportant. But it's still not the canary in the coal mine for global starvation. And there's another significant data point that they highlight that's rather relevant. They looked at crop yields in the US for crops that rely on bee pollination. And they generally found stability or increases in production for those crops, 
Where there were declines, they investigated and found causes that were unrelated to the activity of pollinators. Now, it's clearly an indicator you'd expect to see. If pollinators were in precipitous decline, we would be seeing some impact in the field, literally in the field. So look, in conclusion, let me say this. We know that habitat losses are resulting in declines of all sorts of wildlife, including insects. We also know that we need a lot more data about what's going on because there's a lot we don't know, and that always carries a risk. However, are bees in imminent danger of extinction? No. Are we seeing massive declines in the bees that currently pollinate crops? No. Does that mean that we don't have to care about the problem at all? No, we have plenty of signs of bees under stress, especially from the Varroa mite. When you depend heavily on small numbers of species or varieties of anything, you're vulnerable to something that attacks those species or varieties. Just ask the banana growers. Does the evidence suggest we should be banning neonicotinoids for farmers? I'm not going to go all definitive on that. There seems to be some solid evidence that in real life applications, such chemicals have more benefits than disbenefits. And some of the early studies were flawed. However, it is a deeply debated area. And I would want to be reassured I'd seen all of the best evidence before coming to a conclusion on that one. Given the apparent situation in Australia, plus the demonstrable negative effects on EU farmers of the ban, I'm not convinced the use of precautionary jargon to justify the ban is right at the moment. It is, of course, possible, as certain campaigners have suggested, that given that colonies are already under stress from the Varroa mite, that neonicotinoid pesticide use might add additional stress that pushes them over the edge, which doesn't apply where the mites are absent. Well, that may be the case. Definitely something for further study. But since the campaigners have a committed position against chemicals and the companies that produce them, it sounds like the sort of explanation that without concrete evidence, they basically wish to be true. And if that's the case, they're basically fighting against chemicals, not fighting for the truth. So additional study for sure, because we do want to know the truth. And the campaigners may be right, even if their thinking process for getting there hasn't been an objective one. As they say, even a broken clock is right twice a day. But maybe we don't need a complete ban while the study is going on given that we don't seem to be perched on the edge of the apocalypse that EU lawmakers perhaps feared when they passed the original regulations. I don't know about you, but I find all of that data and background rather reassuring. Maybe we're not in such bad shape as we may have thought, at least in this one specific area. And that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Mm -hmm.